confusion. So I think uh, there was a typo in that question. So everyone who has attempted will uh, get like full credit for that. So just in case you were worried about that. So now let's uh, start uh, the PyTorch tool. Any question uh, before we start? Anything from homework, anything from the programming assignment? And I think there was a question earlier uh, in the office hours today. So we will release uh, a sample uh, midterm exam. So it will be released, I think, so it's fifth, right? Three, six. So uh, roughly like one week uh, before your midterm. So we will give you like the sample paper, which will give you an idea like what kind of questions will be there. So that should help you in the preparation uh, for the midterm. All right, it seems uh, there's no other question. So uh, let's uh, start probably. I think uh, it, it will be like the easiest lecture in the whole course. And if you already know Python, this will be like a piece of cake for you. But if you have like a little bit experience in Python, even then I think you will be you will easily be able to follow this. So uh, deep learning, we have a lot of libraries out there. And again, the list I'm showing here, it's like a very small list. We do have a lot of other frameworks which people are using. And uh, Torch is one of them, which is uh, very popular. And based on Torch, uh, which is based on Lua language, uh, we have PyTorch. So this is kind of uh, using Torch as a backend, and then there is a Python wrapper on to uh, top of that, which makes it uh, makes it very convenient for like uh, researchers who already know Python. Then we have a uh, TensorFlow again, which is uh, in Python. The backend is in C plus plus. Then uh, we have a Tiano, uh, which is again Python based. Uh, Tiano, I think it can take either TensorFlow or maybe any other framework as backend. And similarly, you have Keras and Keras, I think similar, you can either take TensorFlow or you can take any other framework as backend. So this is just like a Python wrapper, which allows you to quickly code your uh, frameworks and uh, go ahead with your trainings. Now, I think uh, there's a question from Steven. Can you clarify how the midterm run on web courses, same time as class? Yes, so it will be at the same time as class 432 uh, to 645 or 545. And I will have to confirm like whether it's uh, 75 minutes or is it one hour, but it will start at 430 during the uh, during the class. And I think it's 21st, so it's I think Thursday. So I hope that was your question, uh, Stephen. Then uh, I have a question from Mert. Uh, I'm writing about the question. I okay. So Mert, I'm not sure. Like. Uh, I'm not sure which email you're referring to. Do you want to talk about this like in one of the officers? Okay, great. Because I'll have to go through my emails. And so as of now, like uh, I have replied to all the emails. And in any case, if your email was uh, not replied, please let me know. I don't know. It should not go to, go to spam. But there was one instance where I think one of the students, he wrote me. Uh, on Saturday and he was just waiting, but I never received any emails. I don't know what went wrong there. So if that's the case, uh, please let me know. Okay, and so I think one good practice you can do is when, whenever you write to me, just copy uh, the TA as well. So just in case I'm busy in meetings, he might reply uh, quicker. That's one thing. The second is some of you are still using like uh, web courses for the email. I will prefer if you can directly write to my inbox. Uh, the email id i have provided because that way i think i will give you a faster response because the emails which are coming through web courses sometimes they are delayed sometimes uh, i have to log into web courses so that's not always like convenient for me 
So it's just like, I will, I will still uh, reply, but it will be faster if it's directly to my inbox. Okay. Uh, so yeah, Matt, uh, let me know, I mean, uh, because from my point of view, I have replied or responded to all the emails. So if you can just reply to that email chain or you can come to one of the officers, uh, we can resolve that. So question from George, how many questions and what type of questions? Yeah, so we will provide like a, a, a sample paper to you, which will give you the idea, like what kind of questions uh, you will have in the midterm. So you will have true false, you will have multiple choice. That's right. You will have short responses as well. Some of the questions will be like quantitative based. We'll have to do some basic calculations. Okay, so these will be like uh, uh, fill in the blanks will be there. So all these variations. So total questions uh, roughly around 20. Okay, so that's good. Let's move on. Okay, so the, uh, again, th this is not a comprehensive list. These are some of the frameworks uh, which can be used uh, for deep learning. And in this course, we will mainly focus on PyTorch. And uh, as I've, I have said earlier as well, uh, it's not a limitation, it's not mandatory. You can use whatever framework uh, you want. It's just that I mean, we, we just want to use PyTorch so that uh, everyone is like on board and will not provide like tutorials in any other framework. So if you're using any other, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's up to you. All right, so we have tensors in PyTorch and that's similar to like your NumPy arrays. If you are, if you started your programming assignment one, then you already know what NumPy arrays are, how to use them. And so tensors are similar. They are used to store data. The, the plus point is these tensors can actually be used on a GPU, which makes them much more efficient because GPUs allow you to like do a faster processing of, uh, of these uh, numbers or these values you have stored in these tensors, whether it's addition, multiplication. So it will be much faster uh, as compared to the CPUs. Okay, so it's faster computation. And so let's quickly look at like how we can define these tensors and how we can use these uh, once they are defined. So you just do an import torch. So torch is a package and then it allows you to like use all the uh, APIs are all the functions you have inside this uh, torch. So that's uh, if if you are experienced in Python, you should know that. So then to define a tensor, and in this case, what you're doing is you are randomly initializing uh, that tensor. So that tensor is a matrix. And this is the uh, simple function for that. You use the torch API. So torch.rand to comma three, it's just describing the shape of that tensor or you can say shape of that matrix. So this means that it will have two rows and three columns, all right? And that tensor will be stored in X. So that's a uh, pretty standard. And then the values in this matrix will be randomly initialized. That's what this function rand is uh, telling you. So if you have used this function in Python, you know that you can do a numpy.rand or something like that to give a random matrix in your in your uh, numpy for your for numpy arrays. Right. So this is again just another matrix, but a different shape. And you can just use like print statement as you do in uh, Python to like print the values of uh, these matrices. Right. So that's straightforward. Let's say you want to uh, initialize a, a tensor or a matrix where it's like all zeros. And again, you might have done this already in Python. It's almost similar. Just torch dot zeros. Five cross three is just uh, uh, providing the shape of the matrix. And this is also interesting. Sometimes uh, this is uh, very important when you have the data already in memory, right? So let's say you have the numbers and you want to store those numbers into some kind of matrix or array. So let, let's say in this case, we have two numbers, 5.5 .5 and three, and I want to create uh, an array tensor for this. So I will just initialize using torch dot tensor and use these uh, square braces, uh, brackets. So it's like a two cross one uh, matrix, or you can say like a two dimensional vector. And this vector will have the values which I'm directly assigning to, uh, assigning to it. This is, uh, it seems simple, but it I think will be the most uh, 
used function when you try to debug your code. So this gives you the size of the tensor. And because most of the time when you are developing your neural network, you will have to figure out, okay, when I have this convolution layer or I have this, let's say neural uh, uh, set of neurons, what will be the size of my tensor after that, right? Or the activation after that. So to determine that you will always do like extra size so that you are actually not making any mistake. So you're going to use this a lot. And again, this is similar to uh, the, similar to the way you use in, in Python. All right, so those are about uh, the variables, uh, how, how to define them, how to initialize them. Let's try to uh, go through like some basic operations uh, which can be done. Okay, so the first one is like adding, let's say if you have two different tensors and if you want to add those values, in this case, let's say X is a tensor, Y is a tensor. And of course, if you want to add them, they will have to be compatible. So, which means that the shape should be uh, same for both. So then you can usually easily use like torch.add and pass X and Y, and that will just add these two tensors. Again, this is very powerful operation uh, you might have used in, uh, in, in Python. So this is indexing. And again, this will be useful uh, when you have to develop like a very complicated architecture where you want to use, let's say, partial features or divide your features. And this is like indexing. So all the index, indexing operations you can perform in Python, you can perform on the PyTorch tensors as well. So this indexing, for example, what you're doing is X is your tensor and you're saying that you want, uh, so this X has, uh, let's say two dimensions, all right, separated by comma. So this colon is just saying that you want all the values uh, in this dimension and you want like the first element in this dimension. So this is like the normal, uh, you can say slicing or indexing the way uh, you do in Python. Uh, there's a question from Michael in, Python, is it print info or print info? I just thought the first was deprecated. Yeah, so if you're using Python 3, then it's like a Python, then you have uh, brackets, and then inside that it will put the value. But if it's Python, like older version, then the first uh, is still valid. So that's not deprecated. It's just difference in the, in the version. And same is here, like if you're using Python 3, then you will have to use these brackets. And I think in the previous slide, I might have used it differently, right? Print X dot size. So there is no bracket. So if you're using Python 2 dot something, then you can use this print. Okay, so that's, uh, that's good. Another interesting operation is resizing. Again, you're going to use this a lot. And the idea here is, let's say you have a tensor or you have a matrix and you want to resize it or you want to like, uh, change uh, change the dimensions of, of that matrix. So let's go through a simple example. Let's say you have a tensor X, which is a two dimensional matrix, four cross uh, four. And what I want to do is I want to convert this two cross two matrix into a flattened feature vector. Okay, so then flattened feature vector, which means that it will only have one dimension. And this tensor has four cross four, which means 16 different values. So if I want to fit all the 16 values into one dimension, it means that it will have to be 16 dimensional, right? So the function is the tensor name, then dot view. And then you can just specify like uh, how many, uh, uh, you can just specify like how many dimensions you want and what will be the size of each dimension. So in this case, uh, we are moving from two dimension to one dimension. And then we know that, okay, how many values we will have because of these to it. So it will have to be 16, but we can uh, reshape like into a different uh, shape as well. So in this case, let's say we still take like the original X tensor, which is two dimensional and want to create another two dimensional vector. But here, what we want to do is we want to move some of the values to the second dimension. All right, so then the size of the second dimension is eight. And then the second dimension, it's a uh, negative one. Negative one means we don't have to specify it. The function will have to automatically infer what will be the value of this dimension. 
So in this case, you know that four cross four, uh, you have 16 different values, right? So if eight values are going in the second dimension, then it means that you will have two values in the first dimension because eight times two will be 16 because you can't like increase or decrease the number of values you have in your tensor. So, but if you are, you can also write two, it will be the same operation, but sometimes what happens is you don't want to hard code it because let's say you don't know the size of this tensor. And that could be like due to various reasons. And it could be like, you don't know the best size when you're coding your network, you always want to change your best size during training, right? So some of these numbers might change. And it could be like, uh, you are changing like a resolution of your input data. So then again, that will change like the shape of your matrices and your network. So there are times when you don't know this and therefore it's like a bad habit to hard code these values here. So then negative one is actually very handy, which will automatically infer uh, the dimension of the first, uh, first axis here. Okay, so I think there's a question from Steven, does torch handle tensor memory allocation under if you want to grow the array while resizing or do you need to manually allocate before? Okay, okay, so I already answered, that's good. All right, so then in this case, you can see again, you can use the print statement to figure out like what's the size of these tensors, X, Y, and Z. So X should be four cross four, uh, Y should be just 16 cross one, and Z should be two cross eight. Okay, four cross four, 16 and two cross eight. Now, so any question on this one, how to reshape or resize your tensors? All right, if not, then you have understood this well. Like, let's quickly have a, a pop quiz on that. So let's say we have a tensor X, which has like a shape of one cross, eight cross, 32 cross, 24, which means that it has four dimensions. And these are like the size of each axis or each dimension you can say. Then I'm trying to reshape uh, this tensor to Y using X dot view, which we just discussed in the previous slide. And these are, and again, this is a five dimensional vector. And these are the size of each axis. And I have a negative one here. Now the question is, what will be the value of, or the dimension of this particular axis, the third axis, where I have negative one. Um, professor, I just have a question. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor, actually, uh, I just had a doubt with that x dot u in the previous slide. Okay. Yeah, we will we'll go there. Probably you can try to solve this because okay. I have already asked this question. Okay. You are a little late. But that's when we'll go back and we'll clarify your doubt. Yeah, grace the third dimension, the place where we have negative one, or you can just answer this question. Like when you print the size of Y, what will be the values like in all these dimensions? Okay, so I think we have an Before uh, going to the answer, okay, so what was the doubt? We can cover that now. Go ahead. Um, professor, you said this minus one, we shouldn't hard code this value. 
So I just wanted to understand like this minus one depends on which value. Does it depend upon uh, like the 16? Like I actually did not understand this minus one, like on which value it depends on. Okay. So let's let's go through this again. So let's say you have a tensor X and uh, the dimension, it's a two dimensional matrix, right? So it's a four cross four matrix. If you count the total number of values in this matrix, it will be 16, four times four, right? Yes, professor. So, okay, now if I want to reshape or resize this tensor to let's say Z, so I will use X dot view. And again, uh, this Z is a two dimensional matrix because we have two places here. And what uh, this function is saying about this uh, description is saying that the second dimension should have eight values. And it's saying that the first one, I mean, try to figure it out yourself. Okay. And that's why it's negative one. So if you have 16 values in X and the second dimension is taking eight, then you can kind of infer, right? What should be the dimension of the first axis? Because the total number of values uh, will not change. Okay. You're not increasing or decreasing the, the size of the matrix. Okay. Right. So in this case, it will be two because eight times two is 16, which should exactly match with four times four. Okay, okay, I got you. All right. okay. Thank you. So the answer was uh, 16 because then the total number of values, again, as I said, uh, should match between these two. So that will give you 16. Now let's try to understand uh, because in Python, when we are uh, working using a uh, NumPy, then we have NumPy arrays, right? And most of the time when you load your data or process your data, it will be NumPy array. So then we should have a way to actually go from NumPy arrays to PyTorch tensors, and then going from PyTorch tensors to NumPy arrays. Uh, let me quickly check the chat. If there's any question. Question from Joey. I have never taken a pop quiz before. So Joey, were, were you able to answer this? So I, I just submitted the uh, number to you directly. Was that right? Or do I have to submit yeah, yeah, to that's a TA? Fine. That, yeah, yeah, that's fine. You can, even TA is also fine. To me, is also fine. Okay, thanks. Question coming from Julie. This was too hard. Uh, was that like sarcastic or? Julie, or was this really hard? Okay. But yeah, I will. I will quickly go through like uh, how you can quickly solve uh, that because when you when you code this, then most of the time I don't think you want to sit with the calculator, right? So I will. I will. I will. Uh, Quickly go, go over that. Let me see if we have. Okay, when will we get great for the pop quiz? Probably tomorrow or day after that. Okay, so so you can quickly. I mean, as I said, like the number of values are not going to change, right? So you can easily see. So if there's an eight here, you already have an eight. So this is cancelled out, right? And then you have a two here, and thirty two. So that takes out like twice of so only 16 remains. And then this eight times three is 24, this 24 cancels. That 16, you can just carry it over to here. Does this make, uh, is it easy now? Oh, you were doing the full calculation. Yeah, that was hard. I agree. If you were like doing the full calculation, it will take some time. Okay, but that's fine. So yeah, as I said, like uh, you'll have to take this trick and then when you code your uh, network, then you'll have to do, do this a lot. So I think this will come in handy. Okay, good. So, all right, so NumPy array, as I said, like uh, we use a uh, decent CPU and Torch tensors we use in GPUs. And that doesn't mean that you can't use a Torch tensors on CPU. Of course you can do that as well. So that's the flexibility you can use. If you have CPU, use Torch tensors in CPU. If you have GPU, use GPU. So it provides you uh, that uh, flexibility. So let's say we have a tensor A, and this is just like a vector uh, of size five. 
right? So it will be tensor like this. What we can do is we can convert this to a NumPy array by simply calling a dot NumPy. Fairly easy, right? So now B is a NumPy array, which will be uh, processed uh, on in, in a CPU. And similarly, like let's say you have a NumPy array, which is A. Again, this is a one dimensional uh, vector containing all ones. And then what you can do is you can just call this function torch dot from NumPy and pass this uh, variable A to this function. Then B will be your torch tensor. Right? So this is like fairly easy to go from uh, NumPy to torch and torch to NumPy. Again, this will be used a lot. Now let's see like some more complicated operations uh, which can be performed. And this is, I think the most, uh, most used uh, operation, which is matrix multiplication. And the reason is we have seen that uh, whether it's like your CNN or its neural network, all the operations, you can uh, represent them as a matrix multiplication. All right, so let's say you have a matrix uh, one, matrix two. This is two cross three, this is three cross three, and you want to multiply these two. And again, uh, for matrix multiplication, we have to make sure that uh, these two matrices are compatible. And of course these are because the second dimension here, it's three and the first dimension here, it's three. So you can do the multiplication. The resultant matrix will be two cross three because these two will cancel out. And of course you can't do matrix two times matrix one because then they will not be compatible. Okay, so for multiplication, you can do mat one, mat two. You can just use torch.mm. So this is for a matrix multiplication. And if you will see like the size of the uh, resultant, it will be two by three. Now, usually we don't do like matrix multiplication by just taking two of uh, two of them. We do that in batches, All right? And now you know that why we do that in batches because you have like a mini batch whenever you train your network. So you will not just have one sample, you will have a group of samples. So for batch matrix, matrix multiplication, uh, what you can do is let's say this is your first batch, this is your second batch. And in this case, each batch has uh, 10 samples, right? 10, 10 samples here, 10 samples here. And uh, the resolution is three cross four, four cross five. So in this case, uh, this operation will do the matrix multiplication of all the samples like in batches. So that's uh, very efficient. Again, the result will be like 10, three cross five. So three cross five is the resultant shape, but 10 because you have like 10 samples as a batch. And of course, like there are many other operations. Um, yes, they are in, yes, is one. there a question? Yeah, a quick question. So yeah. uh, the batch number, uh, does it always have to be the first dimension or can we make it uh, three by four by 10 and four by five by 10? Uh, so it depends, uh, it depends upon the framework. So in PyTorch, uh, your batch is always the first dimension. And I think in most of the frameworks, it's the first dimension. I mean, of course, if you want to make like a third dimension as batch, uh, it's fine. But again, then when you're using PyTorch and you are training it, then it expects like, uh, expects you to actually use the first dimension as batches. And if we are talking in terms of images, uh, then mm -hmm. it's, is it like the third dimension? Is it the channels? Like the first dimension? Is it the channels? Is it, this is channel first no. approach? No, again, uh, in PyTorch, you, the first will be batches. And then I think uh, it will be channel and then mm -hmm. X and Y. And again, you can have the option of channel first equals to true or not. So that's an option when you uh, use the APIs. So if channel first equals to true, then the first will be channel then X, Y. But then sometimes you also want to do like channel first equals to false. In that case, it will X and Y, and then lastly, there will be channel. So you, you will have all those options. Thank you. Okay. okay uh, question from Stephanie, can you repeat? Uh, Okay, Stephanie, which one, uh, matrix multiplication or batch matrix multiplication? Okay, good. I think there are some other questions. Uh, okay. 
Oh, I think that was for the previous one. Okay, so that's clarified. That's good. Uh, what does BM stand for? Yeah, batch matrix multiplication. James answered that question. So that's good. Question from Mert. Could you elaborate a bit more the 10 here? Does it mean there are 10 matrices? Okay, yeah, I will come to that. So 10 here means that you have, right, you have 10 matrices of size three cross four. And we are seeing batch because, uh, and again, I mean, uh, this is, I mean, it's, it's all about like uh, interpretation, right? This is also like a single matrix of size 10 cross three cross four. That's, that's also true. But the way we are using it here is uh, we are saying that we have 10 different samples and each sample has a shape three cross four. Okay, so let's say if you use one here and then you do batch matrix multiplication, which will be equivalent to your matrix multiplication because you only have one sample. Okay, so I think your interpretation is right. These are 10 different matrices in this case. Okay, question from George. So Mert, I think, uh, was, was it clear? Okay, you have one more question. Okay, I will, I will come to that. Question from George, when would you use batch matrix multiplication? When you have multiple matrices and you want to do pairwise multiplication, and I mean, if you use batch multiplication, it will be more efficient. And of course, what you can do is if you have 10 different matrices, you can always use like matrix multiplication 10 times, but it will not be that efficient. So if you want like a faster computation, more efficient computation, you will use bat bat matrix multiplication. If that was your question, George, if not, please, uh, you'll have to maybe rephrase it. Okay, question from Anshuman, can you repeat BMM once more? Okay, got it. I hope it's clear now. So question from Mud. What if we want specific matrices instead of random ones? Then you will have those specific matrices in this batch, right? Either you will, so when you're saying specific, you are either loading it from disk, right? Or you are creating on your own. So if you are creating on your own, then you know how to create a tensor. And if you are loading from disk, then you can either use like maybe NumPy arrays to load first and then convert those NumPy arrays to uh, PyTorch tensors. So right now we are, we are just creating randomly, but these could be like any, any matrices. Okay, so I hope that was clarified. Uh, Question from Kishore, what is L in the, L I think th this was a question last year as well. This I think is representing the type of the data maybe, uh, it could represent long, but I'm not sure. You will have to actually check that in the PyTorch documentation, but it could mean like the data type. Question from Sayed. For example, if uh, it is an RGB photo, we can use batch number three. Batch equals to channel. Uh, no, Sayed. I don't think so. If it's a if it's a RGB photo, then you will have one more dimension uh, here, right? Add it. And then that will mean you can't do a matrix. Uh... Okay, I think it just froze. So can you guys hear me? And anyone of you just use the mic and because it's yes, we can, yes we can hear you oh you can hear me good uh, and you can see the screen as well yes 
Yes. Okay, that's good. Somehow I can't scroll on the chat. But yeah, I will do. So a question from Sayyad, right? You are saying that it's an RGB photo. So can we use batch number three? So that will not be a batch number, right? Because that's your still your one sample. If it's an RGB image, all those three dimensions will be like some XY resolution in the channel three. But then uh, what do you mean by like, uh, I mean, what do you want to do? I mean, what will be the interpretation of matrix multiplication there? Because matrix multiplication is usually like between two matrices, right? Which have two dimensions. So probably don't confuse this with uh, images right now. We'll let us see like how to process images. And then there's a question from George, but when would we have different batch sizes? Yeah, we won't have different batch sizes. Again, I'm not clear of that question because whatever batch size you have, that will be your first dimension, right? And that should be like same as the batch here because otherwise I mean you don't have equal number of matrices to multiply. And if your batch size is changing, then both will change simultaneously. So let's say you change your batch size from 10 to 20, this will become 20 and this will also become 20. Yeah, those were the only questions I could see. I can't scroll it further down. Let me quickly try to machine and see if it works. Okay, comment from frozen. I don't point to much see the point of the presentation frozen. Yeah, I can't. So can you see the slides moving? No, this slide is not moving. Okay, then it's frozen. Quickly. <clears throat> Just give me. So can you see my screen now? Is it moving? No, no it's still oh, on it's chain. Not yeah, I suppose it is moving. Sorry, say that again. I can see this. Uh, no, it's stuck again. Previously, the, the slides moved. This is the second time it's happening. <clears throat> if you can upload the slides on the web portal, we can uh, download it and share the screen maybe. Yeah, I mean, I tried that from my other uh, computer, but somehow I don't think you are seeing that. Now it's not frozen. Now it's moving. Oh, it's moving? No. Okay, good. Yeah. So let me continue from here. So so now you're on your slide 15. That's good. Okay. 
so yeah so the other some of the other operations are like uh, again this is very important the uh, concatenation operation what this does is let's say you have two different vectors or two different matrices you want to join them together so what's that going to do is that's not going to increase the dimensionality of your uh, vector or your matrix it's just going to change like uh, the size of one of the axes and that axis will be like along which you are going to concatenate okay this is very useful operation and again we have squeeze and unsqueeze uh, which you will use so this is going to change the number of dimensions you have and uh, squeeze will I, I, I think if you want to get rid of one of the dimensions and again unsqueeze is if you want to increase the number of dimensions so these uh, will come in handy uh, so let's quickly move on to computational graphs. So let's say uh, I define one tensor X. Again, this is a two cross two matrix and another tensor uh, two cross one. So W is like just for weights. And again, this is a matrix two cross one. Now you have an option requires grad equals to true, which means that this is a network parameter. And for that parameter, you need to compute gradients. Okay, so if this is true, by default, it's false for these two. So for these two variables, it will not compute the gradients because these are not the parameters of your network. And W is like, you know, uh, the weights are actually the parameters. Again, um, B is for biases. You randomly initialize this. So you just have a one bias. And again, you set like require grade equals to true. And if this is true, you will compute a gradient for this bias. So if you draw, if we, if you draw a computational graph out of this, and this is exactly what happens uh, when you create a network. And so if you look at this, uh, X is your input, all right? This is a tensor and W uh, is the weights, set of weights you're going to use. And let's say this is a neural network, then what you're going to do is, let's say you multiply these two, that's what you do, right? You multiply your uh, data with your weights and that's going to give you another tensor which is a and then you're going to add the biases again the biases b which are parameter in your network and that, that's going to give you like the output tensor y okay so this is uh, if you think about this this is like a very simple neural network and this is a computational graph for that neural network and then what will happen is when when you're going to train this network there will be a feed forward step where you assign some values to this x that will be your input data and depending upon what are the values in this weight at that uh, at that moment you will perform these operations get the values of a and then you will have some values for b you will add those and you get the prediction so that's called a forward pass then what you do once you have the forward pass then you will have the ground truth and using the ground truth and the prediction, the network's prediction, you will have some kind of loss function, which will tell you how good the network is predicting. And based on that, there will be some loss value, right? You remember we discussed like uh, uh, defining loss for your network. So then depending upon that loss value, you will compute gradients for the variables or the parameters in your network. So in this case, you have biases and then you have weights as parameters. So then you will compute a gradient. You will just compute partial derivative. And then those gradients will be used to update the values of these two. And then you will move forward with the second batch. And then you will repeat, keep repeating these, uh, these steps. So that's kind of an overview of how the training progress and why computation graph is actually useful. And again, this is like just one uh, a very, very basic neural network. If you define your CNN or a very deep network, your computation graph is going to be very huge. And this is exactly what is being stored in your GPUs when you're training network. And when you say that, okay, your GPU is taking some memory. So this is uh, actually giving you the snapshot of the memory consumption. The data here, the parameters here, then the multiplication operation. Again, you need some tensor to store the values, right? Then the store the biases, store these values. And again, when you compute the gradients for each of the uh, parameter, you need to store those gradients. So those will require uh, the, the memory in your, in, in your GPUs, okay? So uh, this is, I think, fine. We just discussed that. Uh, this is your neural network. So you use torch dot matrix multiplication. 
x times w right and then add the biases very basic neural network and then you use this activation function and that will give you the prediction then you compute the loss value in this case it's cross entropy loss so we have discussed this formulation y is the ground truth p is the prediction and this is for the positive prediction this is for the negative prediction so that's going to give you some loss value uh, you compute like mean of the loss because you might have like uh, multiple samples in your batch so you compute the mean okay, again the three steps like i have just compressed uh, getting rid of the comments then this is very important step uh, which actually computes the gradient so you use that cost value and call this uh, function which is called backward so what this function does is this will compute like all the gradients you require in your computational graph so in this case we have two uh, parameters we have w we have b so this backward step is going to compute the gradient for uh, this as well as this okay so you can easily check like print uh, maybe gradient for uh, the weights gradient for the uh, for the bias you can see that how that's actually changing and uh, so those are like the basic steps when you train your network now the full process is you first define your neural network and we are going to go through like uh, each of these uh, steps in detail and once you have uh, defined your neural network what you do is you iterate over your training set okay. and uh, when you do that iteration you take a batch and that batch is actually processed through the network and you compute the loss for uh, for uh, for that batch and then you compute the gradients so that's called a uh, back propagation and you update the weights of the network so once you have the gradients you can use that formula for a uh, gradient descent right you can update those weights and that's it so that's your like one step of training okay so let's uh, talk about each of these steps in uh, in detail so first step is like how you define your neural network we already saw like a basic neural network but let's uh, go into a convolutional neural networks. Okay, so the package which will come in handy is uh, this neural network package, torch.nn, you will have to import this. And basically what you have to do is you just have to define a forward function, which will specify how your data is actually flowing inside your network. So this forward function is going to take your data as input, and the written value of this forward function is going to be the prediction of your network. So everything what is happening inside your network, it should be in this function forward. All right. So this forward is kind of also feed forward where you have your data as input, you pass it to your network and get the prediction. So that's called feed forward pass. Then the second step is the backward pass, which is called like the back propagation where you compute the gradients. So you don't have to actually implement this because whatever framework you use, it will uh, give you this uh, facility. You can just call that, you saw that you just call that uh, torch.backward, right? It will automatically compute uh, the gradients for all the parameters in your network. So that's really, really useful. Otherwise your coding will be very, very complicated. Okay, so you don't have to worry about backward. You just have to worry about the forward. Okay, so now let's see how we can define this neural network and do the forward pass. So as I said, uh, torch will have to import because we use some functionalities from there. The second is torch dot neural network, which will be used to uh, define your network. So you define your uh, network using a class, and this is just name of your network. It could be anything, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, whatever you want. In this case, it's net. And this will inherit like nn.module uh, uh, class from this package. All right. So whenever you define a class, it will have to be there, no matter what. Okay. And this is required mean because there are a lot of functionalities which you are assuming should be there in your uh, in your network, right? For example, as I said, you don't have to worry about the backward pass. So to facilitate all that, you will have to inherit this because this module is actually providing that, that facility. Okay, so that's one part you can just hard code in there. 
then you need an initializer of course whenever you have a class you have to define this function so again just uh, copy paste this this is just like uh, calling the super class the uh, initializer of the super class which is uh, this uh, module in this case okay so all this is like a basic python we are not in um, pytorch yet then the next step is like you create layers in your initializer and this creating of layers is something like you define each and every layer you are going to use in your network and this is just creation right you are just defining the layers you are still not using it then you will need a function as i said you will have to define this forward function and this forward function will uh, will be there like in all your networks okay this x is the input data which is like uh, input to your network and then all the layers which you have in your network which will uh, go in the forward function so this is a very basic structure no matter what your uh, network is this structure should always be there okay you will inherit this module class you will have a class for your network you can use whatever name you want you need an initializer where you will define your layers and then you need a forward function where you will actually use these layers to define what will be the flow of data inside your network okay so just keep this in mind this is a basic structure or you are always going to use and again you don't have to define a backward function okay so now let's go back to this uh, architecture we have discussed earlier as well and let's define this using a pytorch in this case we have an input image we have uh, some convolution layers we have some subsampling layers then we have fully connected layers and then we make the prediction okay so let's define this uh, in pytorch so this is the full code i will go through like each line uh, in in detail so just go uh, let's go through like the basic structure here as as we discussed you have a class again net is the name you inherit this uh, module so you need an initializer at the first function and these are all the layers which you are defining and this is your forward function which is actually defining the flow of your data and here what you are doing is you are just using the layers which you defined earlier all right and this is just like one handy function um, which is required in this case but again this depends upon whether you need this or not so this is just like a helper function this is not mandatory but these two functions are mandatory all right so this code here you, you can see like it's a very small piece of code this code is actually defining this convolution neural network okay, i think there's a question from uh, uh, could you please go over slide 17 sorry i missed your missed your message all right okay, so 17 17 right now x was your input right and w was your weights uh, let me quickly show you the computational graph Right, and these are the variables we are defining in Torch. X is your input data, W are your weights, B are your biases. So you multiply your weights with the input data, that's multiplication operation. You get like an intermediate tensor A, and to that intermediate tensor, you add the biases to get the network's prediction. So that's the computational graph, and that's exactly what we are doing here. So you use torch.matrix multiplication, right? You multiply these two, and then you add the bias, and you pass this to a sigmoid activation to get the network's prediction right so i hope this is fine and then based on that prediction p right over here and the ground truth you have y you can compute a loss and in this case we are using a cross entropy loss we have discussed this formulation earlier if you have any question please let me know so this loss function will give you a loss value then you just compute the mean, which means that if you have, let's say, 100 samples, you take the mean of all the samples, and that's going to be your loss uh, function. Then this uh, cost dot backward is actually going to compute the gradients. So when I say gradients, that gradients is like gradients for these weights and these biases, because these are the parameters in your network, and these will be updated when you train your network. Okay, so when you do a backward, you are actually starting for from your loss function you are computing the partial derivative use the chain rule go like one step backwards okay we discussed that chain rule uh, in one of the lecture and then 
essentially at the end you will have gradient for all the parameters in this case it's just two but effectively you can have a very deep network it could have 100 layers or 200 layers and it could have millions of billions of parameters but this just one call will compute gradients for all those parameters okay so you don't have to worry about that and once that is done I mean in this case you have these two parameters so you can check like what is the gradient value all right so that was clear So this piece of code is defining that complicated convolution neural network. And a question from Joey, no ReLU in that example. We do have a ReLU, I will, I will come to that. Okay, so let's start from the initializer. What is F? Fernando, we are, we are, uh, we are coming to that. So I will go over each line separately in a bit, just hold on. Okay, so let's uh, go uh, through the initializer. This we have already discussed. Now, in this case, we have a grayscale image. Right? So the channels, number of channels will be uh, just one. And uh, we have six output channels and we are using a three cross three square convolution kernel. So to define this layer, what we do is this neural network package uh, has this uh, function conf2d, which defines 2d con filters. Okay. So in this case, what it's saying is that, so these numbers are really important. One is telling you like, what's the depth of your input data? All right. So if you remember when we were talking, when we were discussing actually a convolution operation, if you remember, I said that the depth of the kernel should always match the depth of the input feature volume. Right, so this is exactly uh, that depth. In this case, the input image is a grayscale image, which means that we will only have one channel, right? So if we only have one channel, it means that it is expecting of a volume with the depth of one. So that depth will have to uh, indicate here. In this case, it's one. Then uh, six is the number of kernels we are using, okay? So in this case, we are just using six kernels. And if you're using six kernels, it means that the output after this convolution layer should have a depth of six. Okay, so that's uh, what it's saying here, six output channels. And the three over here is uh, telling you the shape of your kernel. So in this case, it's just a number three. Then if it's a 2D con, it's kind of implicit, it's a square kernel. And you can extend this to three cross three. And that's what it's saying. It's a square convolution kernel of shape three cross three. Okay. And essentially what you can do is you can actually use brackets here and actually explicitly say it's a three cross three, which will also allow you to define maybe odd shape kernels. It could be three cross five or three cross seven. In this case, it's three cross three. Now, if you think about this, the actual kernel is three cross three cross one because of this depth and you're using six such kernels and writing in this way like con2d and all these parameters this is your self dot con v1 and you can say that this is your first convolution layer okay so any any question on this one because if you understand this like the rest of the layers will be pretty easy you just have to replicate this let me go over uh, the questions so fernando uh, what is f where was that imported from and how does backward knows what to update so two of your questions, I think I uh, will cover those later, but the last one that's interesting, uh, it's asking how does backward knows what to update? So first of all, uh, backward is not updating anything. Okay, let me actually go to, all right. So backward is not updating anything. This is just computing the gradient for each parameter in your network. And the way it knows is because you have the cost here, right? And cost is coming from this loss. So the loss you're computing is between your ground truth and what your network has predicted. And your network has predicted, let me go through the computational graph here, right? So this Y is something which the network is predicting. Now, 
what the backward function will do is it will start from this point and you have the loss function so it will compute the derivative of the loss function with respect to the first variable it sees and then it will start back propagating from here so it will go in this direction then it will go in this direction compute for this again it will go in this direction so all the possible directions it's going to reach like all the parameters of the network so that's how it knows like what to compute so what was that clear uh, fernando and it's not updating anything it's just computing the gradients we'll have a separate update step which will then use those gradients and make the update Then I think there is a question from Lawrence. Is the code example, what is F? So F is just like, a, you can say an API or a package uh, coming from uh, your PyTorch library. Okay, yeah, Brandon, I think answered that. So that's good. A question from Zen Yang. When you say con layer with 40 kernels in the homework, does it mean NN con 2D 143? Right. That's correct, uh, Shannon. So this means like 40 kernels and the depth is one and uh, the shape is three cross three. Okay, question from Brandon. What is defined as a fully connected layer? Uh, we will come to that, Brandon. We are still like on the first layer. Question from Sayed. When I print nn.con2d163, I get the output con 2d 1 6 kernel size 3 plus 3 start equals to 1 cross 1. Do we also define stride here for both axes? All right, so I think that's a very good question, uh, Sayed. So you can also define stride, and by default, stride is 1, and that's why when you're trying to print, uh, you are getting 1 cross 1. So what you can do is you can just uh, add a comma and add one more number here that will be your stride and of course what you can do is you can actually use the name of that uh, parameter right you can say stride is equals to one or two whatever shape you want to use and then that will define the stride for your network or for your layer so that's a good point a uh, question from uh, rochia you said we can use any size metrics for example if we use three cross five metrics so will the value of depth be five uh, no so three cross five is just the spatial resolution of your kernel and depth is defined by this like the first parameter here because this should match uh, the depth of the input the incoming volume right so in this case it's one so it's one so you can't actually control this number this needs to be hard coded because it relies on the depth of the previous layer, right? And the numbers here are just defining the spatial resolution. So if it's three cross five, then the kernel shape will be three cross five cross one, where one is the depth. Okay. So I think I covered all the questions. If not, uh, please uh, let me know. So this is the first convolution uh, layer in your network that's how you define it and again this is just a definition you still have not used it you're just saying that this is like a layer which i would like to use in my network and then you can define many such layers like it's pretty simple once once you know how to do it you can define another layer so this is con2 and again nn.con2d and in this case if you uh, pay close attention the depth is six so which kind of says that I want to use this layer after this layer because this one has six kernels, which means that the output activation map, this layer is going to produce will have a depth of six. And then this is saying that, okay, the incoming activation has depth of six, which is kind of saying implicitly that, okay, this layer will follow this layer. Okay. So we have a depth of six, then this is saying we want to use 16 kernels in this particular layer. And again, the shape is three cross three. So you will have to be very careful about this. Uh, when you do, this will have to perfectly match. And that's why I said like, this is kind of hard coded. It depends on the previous layer. All right, so now there was a question about fully connected layers. So now uh, we are uh, onto that. 
So to define a fully connected layer, you use uh, again the neural network package and linear is the function. So linear is for a linear layer, or this is also like fully connected layer. In this case, you know that linear layer just have to define how many neurons are there. And ex that's exactly what we are doing. And that's coming from the second uh, parameter here, which is 120. So I will come to this later. So this 120 says that this linear layer has 120 neurons. Okay. But if you remember, like when we were talking about neural networks, then the number of weights not only depend on the number of neurons in the current layer, they also depend upon the number of neurons in the previous layer. Right. So then this first parameter is exactly doing that. This is telling you how many neurons or how many weights, or you can say how many values are coming in from the previous layer. All right. So this is similar to like your cone layer. Uh, the first dimension was, or axis was saying that, okay, what's the depth of the feature volume coming from the previous layer? This is something similar, but in this case, it's kind of a flattened feature vector. So uh, it's, it's uh, pay close attention, like how we get this number. So uh, we are trying to implement this network here, right? So you can see that the resolution of the input image is 32 cross 32, all right? And after the first convolution layer, the feature map uh, size reduced to 28 cross 28. And again, you can compute this, you have the formula now. And then there is a subsampling. So again, it's further reduced to 14 cross 14. Then another convolution, so 16 uh, kernels, right? Then again, a max pooling. So after this layer, the shape of the feature map, if you do the computation, it's going to be 16 cross 6 cross 6. So this 6 cross 6 is the spatial resolution, which has actually reduced from 32 cross 32 to 28 cross 28, 14 cross 14, then 12 cross 12, and then a max pooling will give you 6 cross 6. And then the 16 is coming in from here because you had like 16 kernels, right? So the depth will be 16. Now, what you will do here is that in that volume, you will just count how many values you have. And that's going to be exactly 16 times six times six. You just flatten that feature volume and that will be your one big feature vector of this dimension. And that is going to be input to your linear layer. And that's why you have this number here. Okay, so any, any question on this one? All right, so then we can add one more linear layer. This is called FC2. And again, n n dot linear. And you can, yes, go ahead. So this first number, 16 into 6 into 6, it is the number of uh, input dimensions for the linear layer, and 120 is the output size? Yeah, one, 120 is the number of neurons in the current layer. You can say the output, yeah. OK, yeah, now that makes okay. sense. So then you can see here that in the next linear layer, you are saying that, okay, the input uh, dimension is 120, which is actually coming from this one, right? Again, as in con, it should match. In fully connected layers, it should match. And then this is saying that you have 84 neurons in the current layer. Then again, you can add one more linear layer. So this is FC3. And again, because the output here was 84, this should have 84. And then we are saying that, okay, in the final, we just want 10 because we want to do digit classification. That's what we are designing the network for. So digits, we have 10 different digits. For each digit, we want one prediction. And this is your final prediction layer. Okay, so I think there is a question uh, from Fernando. How did we get the six from con one again? Okay, let me go through that. That's actually a very important question. So your input image is 32 cross 32. All right. And then after the con, it will give you six, uh, 28 cross 28. And again, how you get 28, I think uh, we have discussed a formula, right? It depends upon the size of the kernel, the stride, and whether you're using padding or not. So then this is giving you 28 cross 28. Then you do subsampling that will reduce it to 14 cross 14. Okay. And Okay, so this is a bit different. So in this case, we are using a kernel of 10 cross 10, 
but in this case we are using a kernel of three cross three so that's a difference so don't follow these numbers uh, this is slightly different here okay so what will happen after 14 cross 14 is you will perform convolution and that's going to give you 12 cross 12 all right and after 12 cross 12 if you perform max pooling then that will give you 6 cross 6 so i hope that's clear uh fernando it's just using like the formula we discussed in the class and you know the input size you know your kernel size you know the stride just put it in that formula and you will get these numbers so essentially essentially like in, in the final layer you will have have a shape of 16 cross 6 cross 6 which you are just flattening it to like a single one dimensional feature vector okay so instead of this 5 cross 5 we have 6 cross 6 is is it clear fernando Okay, uh, I will wait for your answer and we can go over this again if you want. So question from Ruchia, can we define any size of the kernel in the second layer? Size of the kernel, yeah, I mean, it's up to you, whatever you want to define. And in this case, we are defining three cross three, it's up to you, I mean, define five cross five, seven cross seven, 11 cross 11, okay? So that's just a parameter. A uh, question from uh, Shiva, can you explain again, what is 120? Okay, let me see where we have 120. Okay, so this 120 is the number of neurons in this fully connected layer. Because a fully connected layer I mean, is just like a set of neurons, right? So in this case, we have 120 different neurons. And in this case, we have 84 different neurons. In this case, we have 10 different neurons. And again, you can define whatever number you want. We have to define 10 because we have to make 10 predictions for 10 different classes. And this is just by like intuition, we need 120. Yeah, we simply chose 120 and 84. That's correct, Mark. I mean, uh, again, this depends on a lot of other factors. You can start with 10 cross 10, then you will see that, okay, your performance is not good because you might not have enough complexity in your network. Then you will try to increase it. Let's say go to 120, then you see, okay, it's performing well. Then you will see, okay, what if, we, uh, what if I increase it further? You can try maybe 200, 240. Then you will say it's kind of overfitting, your performance is degrading. Then you may, you might fall back to 120. Okay, so that could be like just one reasoning how you came up with 120. So that's good. Uh, so question from Julie, uh, did we go over how to get GPU access? Uh, not, not yet. Uh, we do have your uh, credentials ready. And I think we will share them maybe after we are done with the tutorial on Thursday. All right. And if you need that sooner, uh, please let me know. Just drop me an email. I will share the credentials uh, before that as well. That should be fine. Then I think uh, there is a question. Mark, that's fine. Okay, Fernando. I think so. Given input 32 cross 30 and kernel 3 cross 3 with a stride of 2, we get the 28 cross 28. But was the 6 chosen? Right. 6 is like just the number of kernels you want. That was your choice, design choice. You could have chosen 12, you could have chosen 64, 100, whatever number you want. That's just like the number of uh, filters or number of kernels you want to use. Okay, so that's why like uh, this number is important and it will depend upon like what are your previous layers. So you can't just blindly like uh, use this, but the second one, of course you can choose, but then again, you will have to follow on that like because the next layer will depend on the previous layer. Okay, question from Brandon, how did we get 16 in the conv2? Con to no 16 we don't we didn't get 16 16 is like a design choice we want 16 kernels in the second layer that's why we wrote 16 it could be 32 it could be any any number okay so in in all the layers like uh 
in 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 case of con, uh, convolution uh, layer the second and, th and the third it's a design choice you can use whatever you want the only dependency is the first one because that depends on the previous layer so you'll have to be careful about that okay one is coming from your input image which is a grayscale image so just one channel six is coming from here because you have six kernels in the previous layer so the depth will be six right similarly like this number is coming from the number of uh, values you have in the previous layer 120 you can choose whatever you want same here and 120 is again coming from the previous layer 84 coming from the previous layer right and it's 10 because we want 10 predictions all right so i think we can end it here we are already over time uh, if you have any uh, further question, just let me know and we will uh, walk through the forward layer in the, in the next lecture. Professor, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, can you go back to that last slide if you don't mind? Yeah, I think I just closed my okay. slides on the other machine. So, uh, what was okay. the question? I, I can, I can, I can talk you through it. You know how uh, in the fully connected layer, the second number is uh, like was one twenty, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to represent like the number of hidden layers. Number of neurons. Number, number of, neurons. of neurons in that particular layer. Okay, so uh, okay, so if we have one fully connected layer, mm -hmm. that number is also supposed to be ten if we're if we're doing the the in uh, the homework, right? Because it has ten different uh, digits that it can identify. Right. right? So that's why we had so, that number ten in the last layer, right? Okay, but I'm, uh, mm -hmm. here in, in step one it says you know we have a hidden layer with hundred neurons, but mm -hmm. then the output is ten. So should that number be hundred or ten? No, if there are 100 neurons, it will output 100 different values. Uh -huh. So we then we need something else to... Yeah, to... you need one more layer, like with 10 neurons to make the prediction. Okay, okay, that's, that, that's my question, yes. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Uh, professor? Yes. Uh, uh, I just wanted to know more about the... So... Are we gonna get allotted with a Linux-like environment or something uh, when we want to access the GPU or something else? Yeah, it will be a Linux environment. It will be a okay. server, uh, huh? but you can connect that using maybe a Linux machine or a Windows machine or a Mac machine okay. because it's just uh, you'll have to do SSH, right? And you can use yeah, SSH. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, will there be any kind of limit to it? Uh, uh, there the, is some limit, usage? I think, yeah, usage, there will be a limit on number of hours you can okay. uh, run your jobs on the GPU. Mm -hmm. But usually it's like, I think, more than enough, so you don't have to worry about it. For the okay. course project, it should be more than enough. Okay, let's say uh, uh, we want, we, I want to continue after the restricted limit. So is it that mm -hmm. the data what I have uh, stored in the system will get... Uh, deleted or something due to the gpu limit no i mean why will it affect your data it, it won't be deleted hello yes can you hear me oh okay yeah it, it won't be deleted I mean because your disk space is different right your gpu quota is different Hello? Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Professor, I couldn't hear you in between. Uh, can you please repeat that? Yeah. <laughs>
Hello, yes, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, Professor, I can hear you. Okay, so what's your answer to the question for your part? Uh, actually, I didn't hear anything in the between. Yeah, what I'm saying is your GPU quota won't hurt your data. It won't delete okay. your data because okay, your okay. disk quota will be different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it, Professor. All right. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you.